is going on, everybody, and welcome to the Saturday edition of the Stochastic NHL Strategy Show. I'm your host, Josh Harris. Nice little March weekend, Easter weekend. Can't believe it's going to be April on Monday. It's kind of crazy. Uh, the season is almost over. Feels like it's been going on for three years and three weeks at the same time, if that makes any sense. Next week, we're going to be here pretty much every day if we choose to be. Uh, there's five gamers or more every day next week. I don't I don't understand Gary Bettman. It's just like, let's schedule 4,627 games on MLB opening day, and then let's have a nice spread out schedule the next week. What's going on, Cliffy? Uh, hey, how you doing? <laughs> um <laughs> No, I mean, the reason is, is like NHL is just like a regional game, right? Um, you know, people in, in Nashville will watch Nashville games, but if Nashville's not playing, I don't imagine there are a ton of people watching Seattle, Vancouver. You know what I mean? And it's the same thing, you know, in like Boston. Um, I don't imagine that there's, you know, Boston's on, people are going to watch Boston games. But, you know, if... Boston's not playing. They're not going to switch on Columbus, Pittsburgh or something like that. Like, you know, there are hockey fans that do that. You and I among them, we watch probably more hockey than anybody realistically should. Um, but most people don't, it's a gate driven league. That's why they do it. It's just, it, it's just really frustrating for fans like us that do like to watch a bunch of different games. Cause you know, I like to watch Montreal, but you know, if I watch every single Montreal game, then I'm missing out on a lot of other early, a lot of other games too, because they play on the same nights as a lot of other teams. It is really frustrating. But uh, hockey all day today, we got the Panthers losing to Detroit right now. Um, Dylan Larkin got hurt, but he came back. That was good to see. So games this afternoon, games after around supper, games tonight. At least there's games spread out all day today, and I'll take that uh, for a nice little Easter Saturday here. Yeah, I mean, like. I'm excited for the playoffs. I'm not excited to watch playoff hockey on the Hallmark channel or whatever weird ass channels that they decide to put them on. Like I'm pretty sure in the United States, I think it was two years ago that there was like exclusive NHL playoffs on the golf channel. <laughs> like whatever. Yeah. Um, I forget what it was. There was there's there was just something going else. There's another sporting event that took up one of the one of the networks that they usually use. So yeah, they had to put, they had to put the playoffs on the golf network. Um, might, have been, might have been the Olympics even. I don't even know. Maybe not. I don't know. Olympics in April. It it maybe got rescheduled because of COVID. I don't know. Like I I, I, don't I, think, I I don't think that was it. We'll just stay golden. But let's get <laughs> into this. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get into this slate. Got 10 games. No Colorado. No McDavid. Not there's not really an overly expensive chalky spot, which is nice, where you can actually like build a lineup without having to play like consider like Shark Three or something. So yeah, let's get into it. Toronto Maple Leafs with a 3.5 total heading into Buffalo. The Sabres have a three total. Toronto going Matthews, Bertuzzi, Domi, Nylander, Tavares, McMahon. Buffalo going Thompson, Tuck, Paterka, Cousins, Quinn, Benson, Skinner, Greenway, Krebs. Looks like Riley and Lilligren are going to be out again, which means Connor Timmons is going to play heavy minutes, be the power play quarterback, and uh, he's cheap. But we'll get defenseman at the end. Here, here we are with the bipolar Sabres. Tage Thompson had a hattie yesterday. This is a back-to-back -back with the Leafs coming to town. It's not as good of a matchup. The Devils suck. It just is what it is. Like they're just they're having an awful season. I mean, it's not like the Leafs are great defensively either, but it is back-to-back -back for Buffalo and Thompson, Tuck, Paterka are extremely high event. The internet is just being stupid now. Um, that line is awful defensively. So Matthews, Bertuzzi, Domi, very much in play for me at 18-6. They have positive leverage. They are coming in with double-digit ownership. But that line, like Buffalo's generally been a good five-on-five -five team, but that line with 
Paterka has been pretty bad. So I, I am very interested in Toronto one here. If you want to go to Toronto two, that's fine. They're more expensive. They're over 20K. And I'd rather get an Austin Matthews line for 18 six. Uh, so it, it would be Toronto one for me. On the Buffalo side, like I, I think Buffalo one's fine just because they're they're good off offensively. They're just not good defensively. Just like going into the the Buffalo side, if you want to, you know, one off a of Dylan Cousins or you know, like a Jeff Skinner or something like that, I think that's fine. But don't think I'm going to prioritize Buffalo on a ten game slate here. Yeah, I I don't mind Toronto here tonight. Um, I did write up Austin Matthews in the picks article mainly because or mainly to highlight that Matthews is still producing very well um, without Mitch Marner in the lineup. Uh, what I wrote up in the article is that Matthews, five goals, nine shots, 5.7 shots per game in the nine games without Marner. Today's game 10. And there, he's not beating up tomato cans. Two multi-point games against Philly, a multi-point game against the Oilers, and 14 shots in two games against Carolina. So he has been producing well, even, um, even without Marner in the lineup. This is kind of my issue with stacking Toronto here tonight. It's their power play. Like, I like Connor Timmons as a defenseman. He's had a lot of brutal injury problems. I still don't think he's on the level of, of Morgan Riley or even Timothy Lilligren, for that matter, um, offensively. Um, and if you look at Toronto's power play numbers over the last couple of years, because, you know, Marner has missed some time. Uh, Matthews has, you know, they have split up the power play at times to – to give it different looks over the last two seasons at five on four with Matthews on the ice without Marner shots go down by about 24% and the goal rate is cut by about uh, is cut nearly in half. Um, so if this goes from an elite power play to an average one, it takes a lot of upside away from Toronto that they would otherwise have because Buffalo's not really a great penalty killing team. I I really like Matthews as a one off here tonight. I'm not sure I'm sold on full stacking that line. Um, you know, if you you want to use like a Matthews Bertuzzi or a Matthews Domi or something like that, I think that's fine. If you want a one off Bertuzzi with the hot streak that he's on, it's like what ten or eleven goals in his last fifteen games. Like that's just nuts. Um, I think that's fine. I'm just not bullish on full stacking them, even with Buffalo. Um, on the back-to-back. -back. On the Buffalo side, yes, that top line is high event, which makes them, you know, give up a lot of chances defensively. They also create a lot offensively. Um, if you look at just Tuck and Paterka together this season, whether it's with Thompson, whether it's with Cousins, um, no matter the center that they've had, whenever they're on the ice together, they create a lot of shots um, a lot of expected goals, and, you know, it's not just expected goals. They're actually finishing uh, the chances that they do get. Like, Paterka and Tuck are up to uh, – it's only like 80 minutes together at 5-on-5, so it's not a huge sample. But 40 shots, 3.3 expected goals, and over six actual goals per 60 minutes. Like, they are doing really, really well. It's <laughs> It feels like chasing points a little bit because of the Thompson uh, hat trick last night. But we know, you know, you and I have talked about that Toronto's penalty kill is not very good uh, on their own. Uh, you know, just like Buffalo's is what I mean. Um, but, you know, the defense of the top line for, for Toronto's, like, league average at best uh, without Marner. The penalty kill is not very good. This Buffalo top line is not coming in with very much ownership. 6% ownership, 7% top two stack percentage. I think I like the Buffalo side here better. I'm worried that I'm getting the the – um, the wrong side of the Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde of, of the Buffalo Sabres here tonight. But I do like the Buffalo top line. It's my favorite stack in this game. I still think one-offing Austin Matthews makes a lot of sense, though. So. Yeah, I mean, you don't have to full stack Toronto. One. I think at least bringing Domi, he's cheap enough, and he's not going to kill you. Like, he's all offense, no defense. So, I don't know. Like, I get your sentiment with Buffalo one. 
It's just like I don't know if I can play them in single entry because they're they're just so bipolar and they've burned me so many times this season. But yeah, the Leafs do suck, and it just sucks that Thompson had a hat trick last night, right? It it just feels bad always clicking in a player when you don't have them the game after a hat trick, and you're just like, fuck, like he needs to repeat this, but whatever. Pittsburgh Penguins with a three point six total heading into Columbus. The Blue Jackets have a 2.9. Every my internet's fine when you're talking, but as soon as we kick it back to me, I'm you know something's going on. Someone's someone's messing with me here. But here we are. Pittsburgh not as big of a chalk matchup in Columbus as they were in Pittsburgh. Wow, I'm so bad. Let me kick it to you. Let me see if my internet clears up. Okay. Um <laughs> <laughs> it, it is kind of funny how that works. Uh, yeah, Alex Nylander being back tonight for Columbus is interesting for a few reasons. One, he's going, you know, he's going straight to, back to the top line with Boone Jenner and Johnny Goodrow. Now he didn't get it, uh, like he hasn't had a ton of time there, but they're up over, um, they're up over ninety minutes together. Two point three expected goals, not that great, but three point two actual goals per sixty. And we know how high event. Uh, the Pittsburgh top line is like they'll go out against Pittsburgh one. Um, even if the defense has been a little bit better for the Penguins uh, with Drew O'Connor on the top line, they're losing the shot attempt battle and 2.8 expected goals against per 60 is uh, a, you know, a pretty bad mark for uh, a top line. So that's a good matchup uh, for Columbus one. The one thing that concerns me is that you're relying on them to do it all at five on five because the Columbus power play is just not very good. Pittsburgh penalty kill is actually fairly good. Pittsburgh's not taking a ton of penalties. They're at 3.1 minor penalties taken per game over the last six weeks. League average is about 3.3. So they're better than that. Um, Columbus doesn't draw a lot of power plays. Like Columbus is at 2.5 minor penalties drawn per game over the last six weeks. The next closest team is at 2.7 and no one else is below 2.9. So like they're barely drawing any power plays. Uh, so you're relying on them to get there all at five on five. Now they can do it because they're not expensive. 15,800 uh, on DraftKings, four and a half percent top two stacks, 6% ownership at 15,800. Like you don't necessarily need, you know, three goals and three point bonuses across the board or something like that. Like a goal and an assist. For a couple of the guys, a couple and assist, a couple of assists for for Gojo with a couple shots, and and you're kind of happy with that. Like they don't need a monster night. I think they're in play. They're definitely not one of my favorite mid mid price targets. Like I would rather play Buffalo than I'd rather play Columbus here tonight. Um, on the Pittsburgh side, you know the Pittsburgh top line is still high event uh, with Drew O'Connor there. Drew O'Connor like three goals, three assists, twenty seven shots in his last nine games. Uh, since the trade deadline, three shots per game and six points. That's pretty good production uh, on the top line for his price. So I think you're perfectly fine to full stack Pittsburgh one. They're coming in with high-ish ownership, but not a ton. 8.4% against an 11.4% top two stack percentage. I'm not worried about any of the matchups on the Columbus side. The Columbus penalty kill has been improving. They were really bad right after the All-Star break and even right before it. Has been getting better over the last you know six, seven weeks. Um, not like the Pittsburgh power play is that great, but, uh, I don't, I do like Pittsburgh one. I'll also mention Pittsburgh two. I wrote up Michael Bunting in the article just because he's getting a lot more ice time, uh, with the Penguins. And that's a big, big change from Carolina. Like Carolina, he was getting, you know, 15, maybe 16 minutes, uh, per game. That's not been the case, uh, with Pittsburgh. He's added two minutes and 40 seconds per game. Uh, over what he was getting with Carolina compared to the Penguins. Three goals, four assists, 2.7 2. shots per game. Like, I, I don't mind Pittsburgh two either. I think it's both top lines I, I'd prefer in this game, and it's the Pittsburgh side that I like better. Just because we have more of a sample of Crosby and Rust uh, playing well offensively than we do uh, Nylander joining the top line, and we know how much Gojo and Jenner have struggled over the last couple of years. Yeah, I do like the Pittsburgh side better too. And they're not as extreme ownership as the other night when the, this game was in Pittsburgh, and it's the same matchups. You know what I mean? Like these teams match up the same as they do at home. Like they're going to see each other the same. 
Another reason I was kind of off pit too is because Malkin just doesn't shoot. When he do, he scored two goals, two power play goals. <laughs> but like the Sillinger Tech Boy Marchenko line sucks defensively. Yeah. So like they're in a pretty good matchup, and I do like the the bunting one off call. Like Raquel hasn't had a great season. Malkin just doesn't shoot enough, even though he hit he had that performance on Thursday. I, I kind I tend to agree with you that I would go to pit on here. Carolina Hurricanes with a 3.6 total heading into Montreal. Canadians have a 2.4. Every time I transition games, my internet just boop. But this is an interesting game because Carolina wants getting minutes now. They're they have a sample on them now. They're just excellent. They're just an excellent line. Just straight up good. Very good offensively, very good defensively. And they're not getting much ownership at all. 2.8%. They're the most expensive line in the night at 21.9. They're fully correlated, though, and this is a very good power play matchup. Like 21.9 is expensive, but it's not to the point where you're like, oh man, I can't fit anything with them. Like what you saw the other night with Minnesota one when they were like 25-7 or whatever it was. Edmonton's been in the 26s at times this season, so is Colorado. 21-9 in this matchup is definitely playable for me. Uh, especially at that ownership. I We did talk about it a little bit before the show that we did have them projected around this ownership on Thursday, and they came in about triple in large field GPPs. So, you know, you know, maybe they come in a little bit higher, you know, 4 or 5%, but they are $1,300 more expensive than they were that night as well. They were almost optimal. Uh, Gensel needed one more point to get the three point bonus. And I think they would have been optimal, but I, I, I do really like Carolina one here. I think you want to go to, you know, Carolina two. It's fine. I just want the power, play, as many power play guys as I can. So if you want to one off a Svechnikov, you want to one off a Netches, it's fine. Like, I, I guess the other lines are fine as fillers, but what are you filling for? Because Carolina one's the most expensive line in the night. You know what I mean? So, at that point, I'm just going to Carolina one or, you know, taking some one-offs from the mid, the uh, middle six. On the Montreal side, I I have n- no interest because usually the Ajo line was the line that was the worst defensively. But since Gensel and Jarvis went up there, their defensive numbers are insane. So I have no interest in Montreal tonight. Yeah, no interest in the Habs either. It's one of those situations you always talk about, like if you crunch 150 lineups and you get – you know, a handful of Montreal lineups, I think you're fine to leave them. I, I'm just not specifically targeting them in, in single entry, three max or anything like that. Um, the question is what to play from Carolina. Uh, th- I was thankful I played them on Thursday, obviously. Um, some people uh, had some nice takedowns. I think Clayton took a second and, and Yellowbird had a, had another first. Yellowbird has back took down the hip check and back-to-back slates. Like, that's pretty wild. Uh, so he had a good week. Um, yeah, that Carolina top line has been great. The Montreal top line has not been that good defensively. Um, also, Caden Gooley got suspended for slashing Travis Konechny from the bench. <laughs> it's not a very <laughs> smart move. I was, was kind of surprised he only got one game, to be honest. I thought that might be like a three or three or five game or something like that because it was from the bench, but he only got one game. But he's going to be out for tonight. And he's a guy that takes a lot of shutdown matchups and is usually good in them. Um, obviously he has bad games. This is still a bad team, but they don't really have anybody that can step into that role. Like Mike Matheson, he's a good offensive defenseman. He's not a guy that I'd want to be playing, you know, head to head every single minute against the opposing team's top line. He has, obviously it's not gone well at times. I can tell you that much. Um, I think it's a really good matchup again for Carolina one. I just worry. It's like that Buffalo situation again, right? Like, um, Carolina won at a great game uh, on Thursday. Feels like point chasing, but they're in a really good matchup. It's a good power play matchup. Montreal's the third most penalized team or taking the third most minor penalties per game over the last six weeks. Uh, Carolina, it's not really drawing a ton of power plays, but they don't really need a lot. They could easily go one for two or one for three here in this game because uh, of how bad the Montreal penalty kill is. So I do like Carolina one. The one line that's kind of sticking out to me is Carolina three. I, I guess it'd be Carolina two in the top stacks. It's the George Stahl line. Evgeny Kuznetsov, his defensive numbers have not been good in Carolina. And if there's one thing that 
Carolina is not going to put up with. It's going to be bad defensive play. And I think that's why you're kind of seeing, you know, that's why I think you've seen Jordan Martin join his, join his lines because they're trying to make it a little bit better defensively. Like they're trying to make this work. I'm wondering how long it's going to be until we see Jack Jury back in, as, as a second slash third line center. Anyways, um, Stahl and Svechnikov playing together. Like <laughs> obviously they don't play much. That's why I laughed at the sample. Their shot attempt shared together in 50 minutes this year is 70%. <laughs> 7-0. 79 shot attempts for fewer than 34 against per 60 minutes. They're going to get the second and third line matchups from this Montreal team. I didn't really like stacking the stall line with Martinook and Jesper Fast there. The stall line with Teravine and Sveshnikov, I think, is a different story. So there's not a lot of ownership. 1% top two stack, 1.3% ownership. You know, um, Sveshnikov is still in the top power play unit, which is getting to be a heavily used unit. So at least you get some exposure there. I think it's both Carolina one and Carolina two, depending on how you want to build your team. I think Carolina two is very much in play against very bad Montreal depth, especially without Caden Gouley. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree. The issue that I'm running into, it's like, what are you saving the salary for? You know what I mean? Like, there's not really like expensive lines on the slate that you need a 12, six line. There isn't really expensive defensemen that I really like on the slate. Tampa, like they're Tampa in a Bay's great match. Tampa, Tampa Bay is almost 23,000. Good point. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I forgot. I'm not having a great start to the show. <laughs> it's Saturday. I'll, I'll pull it together. <laughs> Chicago Blackhawks, a 2.4 total heading into Philadelphia. The Flyers have a 3.6. Uncanny that we go to the next game. My internet just craps out. My dogs are barking. I have a cold. We're just living the dream, making a difference right now. Highest owned line of the night projected. Konechny, Tippett, Frost, 17 19.4% ownership. That's insane to me. I know they're going to get the Bedard line. My God, my internet. Like, I see it on the YouTube. There we go. It's clearing up a little bit. Um, they're going to get the Bedard line, but, like, I, I don't know if I want a twenty, almost 20% ownership on a Flyers line. Just, just feels like bad chalk. I don't totally trust Torts to keep him against the Bedard line for the full game. Bedard even got swapped to the a line with Joey Anderson during the game last night. I mean, time, I so don't like, I don't even trust Torts to keep that line together. Like if for some reason Chicago's up one nothing after the first period, this line is getting broken up. Yeah. So like Like, if you want to play them again, like, I'll just say, if they're your guys, never fade your guys because of ownership. They're just not my guys. In single entry, I'm fading them. I'll be completely blunt. Like, you will not see them in my lineup. They're For their price and the matchup, I think it's fine because, you know, Flyers' power play sucks. Chicago's penalty kill is actually pretty good. So, like, you can play them for sure. It's just, like... At that ownership, I would rather just find a team in a similar matchup with way less ownership. Even the the middle six of the Flyers is getting unbelievable amounts of ownership, and I just I just don't want to. Like the middle six lines are getting seven and nine percent projected ownership. I don't trust Torts as far as I can throw him, which isn't very far. Keeping any of these lines together, so, and one of these middle six lines is gonna see the Dickinson line. So like, what are we even doing here? So like, it would be flyers one for me, but it feels like bad chalk. It's the ownership's way too high for me. Um, it's, it's the Bedard line. That's you throw everything together with ownership and all that. I I'd rather play the Bedard line. And that's another one of those things. Like if Chicago falls behind this game, who knows what, what the lines are going to be. They, they jumbled them pretty hard in the last game. So 
I, I'm probably out on this game outside of like a Bedard one off, a Connecty one off. You know what I mean? Like, I don't think I'm going to full stack a almost 20% projected line in this game. I'd rather just go elsewhere. But again, if they're your guys and you play one to three lineups, play them. There's so many ways to get different. I just, I just consciously can't do it. Yeah, I mean, the, the Flyers' top line, assuming they stay together, like they have good numbers together this season, uh, 115 minutes at 5-on-5 five five together, 73 shot attempts, 3.2 expected goals, um, eight goals per 60 minutes. Now, obviously, they're shooting – they have an absurd shooting percentage, but if they shot 10%, they'd still be over four goals per 60 because they're still generating so many shots. We saw what happened last game when they fell behind. They broke they broke the lineup by the by the second period. Um, that's what Torts does. That's what this team does, and that's what scares me every single time about playing the Flyers. Is that if this team isn't up like two or three nothing in the middle of the second period, it's more likely than not that these lines are getting broken up. Like that's kind of the problem uh, with stacking the Flyers. The other problem is, is like their power play sucks, and this is you know. Chicago doesn't take many penalties. I think they're the least uh, – they've taken the fewest, sorry, uh, minor penalties per game over the last six weeks, like even less than Vegas. And Vegas barely takes any penalties. Like Chicago's just not getting penalized at all. So Flyers have to get there at five on five, which they can do it. But if Mrazek has one good period, these lines are getting broken up. That's what worries me about stacking them for single entries. You're putting all your eggs into the – can the Flyers not – can the Flyers play well for 20 minutes so we, we can get 60 minutes of this line? I'm not sure that's the case. I'm kind of with you. Like, yes, if you want to play Flyers 1, absolutely play Flyers uh, 1 here tonight. Um, I'm kind of with you in the sense that I'd rather play one-offs from this game. I'd rather one-off Bedard. I'd rather one-off Connect Me. I mean, I even wrote up – I wrote up Owen Tippett in the picks article, and I did it because I think this is a really good spot individually – He's been getting a lot more minutes in general. He obviously still shoots a lot. Like, it's a great spot for him. It's a great spot for Travis Konechny as well. Um, I'm just not sure that they're going to remain on the same line for all 60 minutes. Like, that's just the big problem with stacking the Flyers in single entry. So, yes, I'm on board with one-offs in this game. Yeah, If you're 150 maxing, you're probably going to have a lot of Flyers, and I have no issue with that either. I don't know if I want to bet my one lineup here tonight on – John Tortorella not blowing up his roster by the middle of the second period. That's just kind of the problem. Yeah, I agree with you there. You know, the funny thing is we're going to talk about the lightning next. Right before we came on the show, we were talking about the lightning, and then I just completely forgot about them. <laughs> Classic Josh move there. Uh, let's, let's talk about them. New York Islanders with a 2.7 total. Heading into Tampa Bay, the lightning have a th- – 3.3 it's so funny because i the, the literally the first thing i mentioned to you when we connected on Streamyard was holy crap the numbers with duclair on the top line are insanely good and then i just completely fo- uh, forgot and i said carolina wants the most expensive line of the night wrong it is tampa one they are 22 8 that's that's not that's not terrible they're coming in 2.7 percent projected ownership and here's the thing since Wa has flip flopped Palmieri and Barzell, the defensive numbers have been sliding. The penalty kill still sucks. The numbers with Duclair on Tampa's top line are insane. I'm very much in on the Tampa top line here. Duclair's not on the top power play unit, but that's okay. Tampa won. One of my favorite lines on the night, despite me forgetting about them. Please forgive me. Um, again, I don't think Tampa two, I don't, I, I don't understand why Tampa two is getting more ownership than Tampa one. They suck. And one of the things we were talking about was what are they going to do with Stamkos in the playoffs? Cause like put him on the top line. He brings that line down. You put him on the second line that brings that line down. You don't want to put him on the third line. Cause that's just insane. It's Stamkos. You know what I mean? So like the sample with, with Hagel and Sorelli, it's getting up like 175 minutes, and they're just bad. So it's Tampa 1 for me. On the flip side, like I guess the Islanders' top line is fine. I don't really want to make a living in single entry, 2.7 Islanders. 
with you know almost two percent more projected ownership than Tampa one. But like, yeah, the, with the clear up there, their offensive numbers are excellent. The defensive numbers aren't as good, but like Tampa one's easily my favorite line on in this game. Like the honors top line's fine in MME. I just don't think I'm gonna get there in single entry. It just, you know, I'd rather play, you know, Winnipeg that we'll get to. There's a couple other lines that I, I much rather play than Islanders top line here. Yeah, remember us uh talking about how good uh the Islanders defensive numbers were when after Patrick Law took over, and they were legitimately good. Uh, for a while um, with Patrick Waugh uh, behind the bench. I honestly did not see that coming, but uh, you, it's one of those things like you just got to kind of hand it to them because they were limiting the goals against and expected goals against, which was a big problem earlier in the season. That certainly has not been the case uh, of late. Uh, the top line is over three expected goals against per 60 over the last 10 games. The second line is below average. The good defensive lines have been the third and the fourth lines. And that's fine when you're at home and you can send those lines out in shutdown matchups. It's not fine when you're on the road and all of a sudden those bad defensive lines are going to face Nikita Kucherov and Braden Point every single time they step on the ice. Like, that's kind of the issue. I I really do like Tampa 1 here tonight. Um, I wrote them up in the picks article today uh, because of how much I do like them. 38-33 in shots for Duclair and Kucherov on the ice together, outscoring the other, other team 7-4 to four in 60 minutes together. So scoring more than one goal every 10 minutes is, like, really absurd production. Um, obviously, it's a great power play spot as well. Like, the Islanders penalty. So, one thing that didn't get better under, under Patrick Wall is the penalty kill. The penalty kill is still bad. And it's not just the goaltending. I see Sorokin taking a lot of blame for some reason, which is like, does anybody actually watch the Islanders play most of the season on the penalty kill, it's been a, like it's fire, it's fire wagon hockey at best. Um, the one saving grace for the Islanders is that they don't take a ton of penalties. They're one of the least penalized teams in the league. They're down there with like Chicago and Vegas, at least uh, over the last six weeks. But um, it's another situation uh, like we were talking about uh, with Carolina, where even if Carolina doesn't take a ton, uh, get a ton of power plays. They can go one for two or one for three very easily against a bad penalty kill. Tampa Bay can go one for two or one for three very easily against this Islanders penalty kill, uh, if not better. I really do like Tampa one. I understand they're a little cost. They're cost prohibitive, right? They are really expensive at 22,800. The nice thing is, is like there are a lot of low price lines uh, that we'll talk about that we'll get to. I mean, we talked about one uh, with Carolina, which I think was certainly in play. Uh, you mentioned, you know, we talked about Pittsburgh too, not our favorite, but that's also in place certainly uh, because of the matchup. There are others on the slate that we'll talk about that you can pair with uh, Tampa one, like Tampa one's not getting slammed into my lineup, but they are grading as one of the top stacks here today, uh, even when factoring in price. So um, the top stacks tool agrees 13.6% top two stack, 2.7% ownership. I really do like Tampa one. No interest in the Tampa depth until they. I'm getting tired. Like, I, I I'm a big Stamkos fan. I honestly, after he shattered his leg, I thought his career might be over. And what he's been able to do over the like the eight years since or whatever, um, very impressive. He's no longer a top six player, or at least he hasn't been this season. It's it, it's it's kind of tough to watch, honestly. Now that I've slandered him, I fully expect a hat trick out of him. But for me, this is a Tampa one or bus game, and yeah, I have no interest in the Islander side either. Um, if anything, honestly, it would be the second line with Barzal and Anders Lee, but uh, um, I'm, I don't think I'm going to get down there in my single entry. That'd be more of an MME thing for me. Yeah, so I don't really want to play Anders on the slate. Um, Tyler, I see Tyler's in chat just spewing nonsense. He's not going to be an Anaheim duck. He's probably going to finish his career in – Tampa Bay. I'm probably wrong there too, but Ottawa Senators with a 2.6 total heading into Winnipeg. Los Jets have a 3.4 total. King Bacon Pie has joined us for the Jets. Gabriel Velarde is back. Thank God the Alex Iafalo um, experiment on the top line is over. Velarde makes that line so much better. He makes the power play so much better. Um, 
the way Winnipeg matches at home, that top line is going to see second and third line matchups. Like Stutzel and Giroux have been pretty good, but you throw Angus, Crookshank, Hermione's cat into the mix. Like I, it's very advantageous for Winnipeg one, uh, Ottawa three, nothing to be afraid of defensively. I, I do really like Winnipeg one here. They're coming in at 3.6% projected ownership. The one thing you, you could be worried about is, you know, this is the first game in a month for Velarde and he had uh, a large spleen, but like, I'm willing to take that chance. He's obviously healthy enough to play. He's power play one. Ottawa centers, you know, they've gotten better of late, but they're still a dumpster fire team. So I, I very much like Ottawa one here, or excuse me, Winnipeg one. On the Ottawa side, going into Winnipeg is just a miserable experience. If you get like one of 20 in your crunches or one of a uh, few, uh, like three of 150, you can leave them. But like, I, I'm not in on the sense tonight. Yeah, not a lot of interest in Ottawa either. Uh, pretty tough matchup across the board, especially now that um, Winnipeg has their actual full lineup and they can kind of have their lines that they'd like them to have. Now that one of those situations like Montreal, like if you get a couple in your 150 lineup crunch or something like that, I think that's fine. But no, I'm not stacking them uh, in single entry. I have way more interest in the Winnipeg side. Winnipeg top line's not really coming in with that much expected ownership, 3.6%. Like, that's not a lot, especially at 18,600. Like, this could easily be a $20,000 line if they have a good couple weeks. Um, I wrote up Gabriel Velarde in the picks article. On the top line, when he's been on the top line at five on five, their goal scoring has been 50 58% higher. Sorry. And on the power play, the goal scoring goes up 75%. Now, obviously, there's a little bit of luck one way or another uh, with those numbers, but they have genuinely been creating more and better quality uh, with Velarde than with just about anybody else that they've tried. And, you know, they've tried a lot of different pieces because Velarde's only played about half the season. Um, he had an injury earlier this year that kept him out for like a month or whatever it was. So, um I really do like Winnipeg one here. They're going to get the second and third line matchups uh, from Ottawa. Like, yes, I do like Tim Stutzla as well. I'm not sure, like, this team's being coached <laughs> to their maximum capabilities under Jacques Martin. And uh, with Angus, like, with Angus Crookshank there, they're getting run over. Um, it's something like 44% of the shot attempt share or something like that in limited minutes with him on the left wing. Not that worried about that. I'm definitely not worried about a third line uh, that has Dominic Kubalik and Matthew Joseph as the wings. Like Ridley Grieg is really good, but he can only do so much. Like, um, poor guy. This is a really good matchup for Winnipeg 1. I think it's the power play boost from Velarde that, that helps more than anything. Like the Winnipeg power play had really been struggling a lot. They've had some good games over the last month, but generally speaking, when he's been out of the lineup, it's really struggled. And the Ottawa penalty kill hasn't been bad, like shots allowed around the middle of the league, but the goaltending has been abysmal, which has been kind of the case for them the, uh, this entire season. Winnipeg 1 is is one of my favorite lines uh, on the slate. That's why I wrote up Velarde. That's why we're talking about them uh, extensively here. Really do like Jets 1. If you want to dip down to Jets 2, I think that's fine. Like they have been playing well. 67 shot attempts for 55 against per 60 minutes and there's 60 minutes together. You know, you still get Monahan on the top power play unit. Like that's fine. It's just, you know, Connor Shifley and Velarde are play all the minutes together, five on five and power play Connor. You know, if this is a four, two game and Ottawa pulls the goalie, Connor and Shifley are going to be on with the empty net. <laughs> like These guys are very famous for getting a lot of empty net points um, for DFS players over the years. So, you know, I think both top two Winnipeg lines are in play. What Winnipeg one is the one that grades better for me and the one that I just personally like a lot better in this matchup. Yeah. So uh, Winnipeg one, then Winnipeg two, and then honestly, probably Winnipeg three before I, I get to the Ottawa side. Yeah, I, I don't really like Ottawa at all in this game. I'm very much in on, on Winnipeg one. They're one of my favorite lines. On the slate, Boston Bruins with a 3.1 total heading into Washington. The Capitals in a playoff spot somehow have a 
<clears throat> Boston Bruins top line twenty thousand three hundred. Pasternak, Marshan, Zaka. Here's the problem. They just don't play well together. It's like Panarin and Zabanajad. They just don't mix well for whatever reason on either end of the ice. I still think a Pasternak one-off is fine. It's just, you know, Washington has a decent penalty kill. I don't know, man. Like at 7.3% projected ownership, I'd much rather play Carolina. I'd much rather play Winnipeg. And with Martian and, and Pasternak together, that brings McMichael, Oshie, and Ovechkin into play, despite them not having great numbers. Like, I don't particularly love this game for DFS purposes. I, I'm I'm not a huge Boston Bruins stacker in DFS, if you haven't figured that out by now. Sorry, my internet has been brutal today. Nothing I can do about it. But I honestly think you take ownership and price into consideration. Ovechkin, Oshie, McMichael is my favorite line in this game. Yeah, I wrote up Connor McMichael uh, in the picks article, mainly just because he's been getting so much ice time. Like there have been a lot of 18 minute plus games for him uh, over the last few weeks, you know, justifiably so. Like he's he's played pretty well for them uh, so far this uh, so far this season and you know, in the minor leagues. And I think a few years ago when he was a full-time player as well, like he's just done really, really well. Um, I do like Washington one here. I'm going to be honest. I started today liking the Washington side more than the Boston side, which like when I say that out loud, it feels absolutely ridiculous. I get what you're saying about the Boston top line uh, and Pasternak and Marshan. The thing is, is like over the last two seasons, they're up to nearly 400 minutes together with any centers but Krejci and Bergeron. So we're talking Charlie Coyle, we're talking Pavel Zaka, you know, so on and so forth. And they've been able to pretty consistently outscore their expected goals numbers. And I don't think that would be a huge surprise uh, with Boston or with Pasternak and Marchand on the ice together. You know, you brought up Panarin and Zibanejad. Like, I think that's an apt comparison in this sense, like Panarin and Zibanejad have typically been guys that have been able to outscore their expected goals numbers and often by quite a lot. And I think that's what's happening as well with Pasternak and Martian. They're just both really, really talented. Um, they're all in the top power play unit together. They're not getting a lot of ownership, 7.3% ownership, 14.6% top two stack. That's what's kind of concerning me here. It's like, the top stacks tool has them as the third highest projected line by uh, top two stack probability here tonight. And the other two lines above them are really, really chalky uh, from Toronto and Philly. So like you have a chance to get a line that's not that expensive, 20,300 perfectly correlated with good scoring rates over the last couple of years. It's a Washington team that, Let's be honest, isn't very good, even if they do get into the playoffs. And a Washington team with a penalty kill that has been sliding. I start like I, I started this day like when Washington won. And as I, you know, kind of as the projections came out and as we saw the top stacks, like I started thinking about it more and more. Like I I like Boston one doesn't grade out that well for me personally. Like it's one of those things where I'd have to go against my numbers, kind of, and and um I think I like the Boston side more here and I like Boston one obviously um, for their perfect correlation. And I like any line with David Pasternak. So Boston one for me and then Washington one, if you want to stack one of the depth Washington lines, because you're going to play Tampa or something like that, I think that's fine. But I think this is a game about both top lines and I prefer the Boston side more than Washington. There's a rare instance where we disagree, but like I have a pretty anti Boston bias i don't know why like if anyone would have a boston bias on this show it'd be you <laughs> yeah but it's, it's funny that i just like i i don't know i don't know i'm just i am who i am san jose sharks with a 2.3 total heading to st louis the blues have a 3.8 total biggest total on the slate for st louis blues Oh, I wish Haas was still playing DFS. This would be fun. But 
Still going Thomas, Buchnevich, Neighbors, Kairou, Shen, Saad. The Thomas line coming in at 16.4% projected ownership. The Kairou line, 14.7% projected ownership. We'll just get the St. Louis 2 out of the way. That's absurd ownership for St. Louis 2. I, I can't consciously play a 15% sod. I don't care it's, if it's the Sharks. St. Louis 1, it's a different story. Like if it was Buchnevich, Thomas, Kairou at 16%, I'm full sending. Like full sending. I like Jake Neighbors. Don't get me wrong. I'm a, one of the biggest neighbor slappies you'll find. He's not Jordan Cairo. And yeah, they're fully correlated on the power play. Yeah, they're they're 15-7. But 16.4% projected ownership. I don't know, man. Like, I think if I was gonna play the blues here tonight, and they're definitely circled, I'm just straight on full power play stacking. That's a that's a way to get different. I just I like St. Louis one's fine, but stacking St. Louis one. In a good power play spot, a good five on five spot without Kairu just feels brutal. So, like, I'm either full power play stacking or I'm not playing the Blues. Like, that's just how I'm approaching the Blues here tonight. On the Shark side, <sighs> on the Shark side, uh, we are a team. No, thank you. Yeah, I won't be long on the San Jose side. Um, if you want to play Grandland, Zetterlin, uh, clean cost, and they're not going in with that much ownership, 0.8%, 1.1% top two stack. The numbers are bad. They're not as bad as you might think. 60 shot attempts for 65 against per 60 minutes, only 70 minutes together. There have been a lot of goals against, <laughs> and, and that's why uh, a lot of people really do like St. Louis. Uh, you know, if, if you want to play San Jose one, I'm not going to say no. I think there are just other um depth stacks that I, i'd rather play here tonight what to do with st louis is interesting and it's also interesting to hear you slag brandon side considering him and mika zibanejad have the same amount of goals this season they each have 24 i have, I have not been high on mika zibanejad this season i will be the first one to tell you he's had an awful season I just thought awesome. it was really, really funny uh, because I I knew Saad had been on a little bit of a heater of late. I didn't realize um, it had gotten him to 24 goals. Uh, yeah, he has 24 goals on the season. But I, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly uh, about how to stack St. Louis here tonight. I think if you play them, it is, it is just a full-on power play stack. Like, the Blues have actually been drawing a few more power plays, and San Jose has been taking a few more penalties. Like, these are teams – like, San, St. Louis wasn't drawing many power plays – Earlier in the season, San Jose wasn't taking a lot of penalties. It's kind of reversed itself over the last couple months. Um, San Jose, above average by minor penalties taken per game over the last six weeks. S St. Louis, about league average in minor penalties drawn per game over the last six weeks. Like it is, It has been a big difference both ways. St. Louis gets like three or four power plays here tonight against the San Jose penalty kill that is allowing the most shots against per 60 minutes on the PK over the last six weeks. Like the only reason San Jose, the only reason why San Jose's games have not looked a lot worse than they have is because the goaltenders have been really, really good uh, on the penalty kill. Now imagine how bad San Jose has looked for the last six weeks, and imagine things probably should be worse. It's 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 terrible. Um, I agree with you. It's a it's a good power play spot. The St. Louis power play has been a lot better with Jake Neighbors. You know, Tory Krug back came back a couple games ago. Um, all systems go. I think power play stacking St. Louis one is perfectly acceptable. Full on jaw stacking, I think, is perfectly acceptable. Just you know, all five guys on the power play, and then throw in a little Brandon side uh, just for the hell of it. Uh, um, I it is the St. Louis side. Uh, clearly, I like way more here. It's just figuring out how you want to stack them. Yeah, like for me, it's power play stack. Like I can't consciously put in St. Louis one without Kairu, and then once you add in Kairu, you're like. Well, Krug is 4,400 or whatever. So I was just like, let's go. You know what I mean? <sighs> let's talk about the last game of the night. Dallas Stars, the 3.3 total heading into Seattle. Uh, and is that the last game of the night? I am still struggling. Los Angeles Kings, <laughs> they 3.1 total heading into Calgary. The Flames have a 2.5. I see reading comprehension that has been added to my long list of problems today. It's okay. We're allowed to be off today. 
Yeah, it's it's been it's a it's a holiday weekend. Yeah, at least my internet has been better the last ten minutes. So we uh, we take the glass half full. Clayton says, "Leave the sharks to Jake." Jake will obviously have like forty one percent border low tonight, but that's just how he rolls. <sighs> These Calgary lines are just poopers. Coleman, Backlund, Huberdeau, Kadri, Kuzmenko, Pospisil, Sharon Govich, Zari, Coronado. Like, Backlund and Coleman without Mangiapane have been league average defensively, which is kind of crazy. It's like 2.6 expected goals against for 60. You throw Huberdeau into that, I don't think they're going to be, you know, anything special defensively. I, I do really like the Kings – one line here and it's kind of an ownership thing right because they're kind of priced in that range where there's a lot of good teams and good matchups around that 17 18 000, but they're coming in at 1.1 percent projected ownership you get Kempe and Kopitar on the top power play byfield on the second unit but as you have come to hear from us in the past 18 months he is not a third wheel he is a very good player I am perfectly fine with LA1 here. You want to go to LA2, I think that's fine as well. 16-7, 2.4% projected ownership. Like, I, I don't understand, like, Mangiapane's out. They break up the the uh, kuzmenko Sharon Govich line, which has been very, very good defensively. Now they have, like, three kind of not great defensive lines. You know what I mean? So, like, I, I do really like the Kings here as a sneaky GPP play. On the Calgary side, like going against LA is just miserable now. Like it, it's just not a fun time at all. These lines for Calgary just leave a ton to be desired. And it, it shows like right outside of Montreal, who's playing the best defensive team in the league, Calgary has the lowest home total on the slate at 2.5. Like this is just a brutal, brutal matchup. I, I don't think I have any interest in Calgary here from a stacking perspective, one off Kadri, whatever, one off possible still, but like I am certainly not going out of way, out of my way to get any of these Calgary skaters in my lineup. Yeah. I, the only Calgary line that I might kind of gravitate towards is Kadri, Kuzmenko, possible. So the only reason is you get two out of the three guys on the top power play unit and Calgary has been drawing power plays. They're at 3.9. Um, minor penalties drawn per game over the last six weeks. It's the second most in the league and the most on this slate. Um, Florida's first and they play this afternoon. So um, Calgary has been drawing same, and the Kings have been taking penalties. They're at 3.6 times shorthanded or not time shorthanded. Sorry. Minor penalties taken per game over the last six weeks. Like that's, it's not amongst the most like Florida and Anaheim are, you know, kind of in a tier of their own, but they're not far behind teams like Montreal and Philadelphia. Like they are, they have been taking penalties. Calgary has been drawing power plays. You get two out of the three guys on the top power play unit. It's one of those situations where if I was 20 maxing, maybe I'd have one of them. If I was 150 maxing, maybe I'd have a few single entry. I don't think I'm going to get there, but I do think they're, there are reasons to play that Kadri Kuzmenko possible so long, especially like you mentioned on the last show, they're like, Pospisil has been getting more ice time. Um, there's There was, for 50 games or whatever, Pospisil was getting like 10 minutes a game, 10 or 11 minutes. And now he's like 14 to 15. That's actually playable. Um, I just don't, I just think there are other cheap lines that I can go to that I prefer, but I do think they are one of the lines that you could use if you're playing like Boston one or, or Carolina one or something. It's the Los Angeles side that I have a lot more interested. In. It is Los Angeles one that I wrote up in the picks article mainly because they kind of found their scoring again under the new coach. 31 shots, 2.9 expected goals, four actual goals per 60 minutes uh, since Jim Hiller was hired. Like, you know, they haven't been together the entire time. Kempe missing missed some games. They've had Byfield down on the third line, but um, all on the top line together. Not worried about any defensive matchups on the Calgary side at all. And... Calgary, since they traded Chris Tanev, it's been over four weeks now, 20th by expected goals against, 29th by actual goals against per 60 minutes. So this has not been a very good defensive team. Now, Jacob Markstrom starting is one of those things that gives me a little bit of pause. Like, we like Dustin Wolf, but if, if, if I'm playing DFS, I'd rather be shooting against Dustin Wolf than Jacob Markstrom. 
But um, I do think Kings 1 is one of those mid-price lines that I do like uh, here tonight. If you want to play Kings 2 instead, absolutely no issues with that. You want to even dip down at Kings 3, I think that's fine. Um, if you want to use them as a fillery type stack, but I I would prefer to go to the Kings top line here tonight. Two out of the three guys on the top power play unit. They typically play a good amount, if not a lot of minutes together. Not priced like they need 21 or 22 minutes either. So Kings 1 for me, then Kings 2, then probably the Kadri line, and then Kings 3. Yeah. Daily deposit prospects as Markstrom's in consideration. Load in the Kings. Yeah. Yeah, Dallas Stars with a 3.3 total heading into Seattle. The Kraken have a 2.6. <laughs> oh, that's one of my favorite sticks that we have discovered this season. Oh. This game, uh, it's not really a fun late hammer. We'll, we'll put it that way. <laughs> um, Seattle's just good defensively. Dallas is just a good team. There isn't, I don't think there's anything in single entry that I would, you know, go play. I don't know. Like, I think uh, the Duchesne Sagan Marchment line is fine to play in MME. I think the the Johnston Ben Stankoven line is fine to play in MME. It does kind of suck that Stankoven isn't on the any either power play unit anymore. That's kind of why I, I like the Duchesne Sagan Marchment line a bit better. Like Dallas one, like fine, but like I'd rather play Winnipeg. I'd rather play. There's so many lines that I prefer to Dallas one here tonight. The Seattle side would probably be my preferred side. <sighs> But, like, it doesn't really excite me. You want to play the Beneers line, you can play the Beneers line. You want to play the McCann line. It's fine. It's just, I don't know, like, th this game just seems like it's going to be, like, kind of like a low-scoring slug uh, sludge fest. So, you know, if you get to them in MME, you get to them in MME. I don't think I'm going to prioritize them in single entry. Yeah, I'll say I have no interest in Seattle here tonight. Um I think I think we got we got away with playing Seattle a couple a couple times this week against the Ducks. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take that found money and run, and that, that might be the last time I play the crack in this season. I'm gonna be honest. Um, I was looking at the defensive numbers since the trade deadline. There are two teams allowing 50 shot attempts per 60 minutes or fewer since the trade deadline, and they're Carolina and Dallas um, at five on five. And, you know, Dallas doesn't take a lot of penalties. Seattle's power play usually sucks anyway. So this is – it just feels like a brutal matchup for the Kraken. It's one of those cases where I'm definitely not stacking. Maybe if you want to play like a one-off, Jordan Eberle, Jane Schwartz, uh, Jeremy Kahn, um, Ely Tolden, and like those types of guys, like a one-off I think is fine. I have no interest in stacking Seattle. I'd have more interest in the Dallas side. I'm not running out to play Dallas here tonight. Especially where, like, we knew that they were spreading out ice time. Since the trade deadline, every single forward is under under 17 minutes a game. Like, the, most of the season, even, like, Jason Robertson, like, in the low times, be at, like, 17 and a half. Rope Hints might be at 18 minutes once in a while. No, every single forward is under 17 minutes a game over their last, I think it's eight games or whatever it is. So, in that situation, I don't have a ton of interest in paying up for Dallas 1. Um, I'd rather go to the cheaper lines. It's between the Johnston line and the Duchesne line for me. I think I would go back to Johnston, Stank, Oven, and Ben. They just, they just keep producing, right? Um, it's one of those things. Like until they until they stop scoring, why would you stop playing them? Like I'd I'd rather I'd rather get get away from them one game too late than get away from them one game too early. Is kind of what I'm getting at. It's not a particularly great matchup against Seattle. I don't think it's a necessarily a brutal one either. And I think that's why you're seeing Dallas with a 3.3 total, which is the fourth highest road total. And, you know, the other teams are Buffalo, Columbus, and Montreal. Like, Seattle's been a pretty good defensive team most of the season, and Dallas still has a 3.3. It's because they can score across three lines. Um, but it's also because of how good those second and third lines have been. Johnston, Stankoven, and Ben, you know, they're still at 
three and a half expected goals, still at 3.9 expected goals. They're get, you know, at, at the top end for Johnson, you'll get 16 minutes from him, which is about what Robertson and Hints are going to play. So I'm fine playing Johnson, Stankoven, and Ben again if you want to go to the Matthew Shane line because you need to save some money for your stacks for whatever reason. I think that's fine. But it's the Johnston line for me. Going to be honest, I don't think I'm going to be stacking anything out of this game. Yeah. I mean, why Johnson's been on a, a different planet since Stankoven has come up. So, like, yeah, I get that. I just, I just thinking like because they are cheap. Like the Duchesne line is sizably cheaper. You know, they're seventeen hundred dollars cheaper. That line with Sagan there is completely different than when Sagan's out. I, I'm fine with both the middle six there. Let's talk about some uh, defensemen. And despite me forgetting about Tampa Bay, I the point about not really spending up for defensemen here tonight still stands. Like I don't really love anyone. At the top of the board, at the top of the board, it's Wierenski, Rasmus Dahlin, Noah Dobson, Victor Hedman, Wegar, Carlson, Seth Jones, Jacob Chickler, and Josh Morrissey. I think if I were to spend up, I would go Hedman one, Morrissey two, Rasmus Dahlin three. But, like, I I do like the mid-range here. Like, Krug obviously stands out. And then the punt guys. I kind of prefer too. So like I, even if I'm playing two mid range lines, I don't know if I'm going to be spending up for def- yeah, spending up for defenseman here. What do you think? Yeah. I, I mean, Wierenski grades out well for me. It, it He's projecting pretty well um, on stochastic as well. Like I'm pretty sure he's the top projected defenseman on the slate. A lot of it is ice time um, over 24 minutes in four of his last five, uh, 27 minutes in the last game. Like he just, he does play a lot of minutes. He puts up a lot of peripherals. I think he's fine. Um, Victor Hedman as well, just because it is such a good power play matchup for Tampa Bay. I think Rasmus Dahlin's playable. I worry about minutes because he did play a ton last night, and I'm not sure they want to do that in back-to-back nights. I mean, maybe they will. Um, we'll see. But it's Wierenski and then Hedman and then probably no one else. Mid-price range, like Tory Krug at 4,400. You mentioned him earlier in the show in a power play stack with St. Louis. Like, a 4,400 is such a good matchup. He's like he's going to carry a ton of ownership, obviously. Uh, but Krug uh, stands out for his price. You know, Josh Morrissey definitely in play. Uh, Brent Burns obviously in play uh, for Carolina. Like Cam York still putting up a lot of minutes, still putting up like, and it's not that he's just blocking a lot of shots. Like I noticed, I think it's his last 12 games. He's over three blocks per game, like literally over a draft kicks block per game. Um, but he's shooting the puck as well. It's over two shots per game. He's getting some top power play time. I think Cam York is fine. Um, if you don't want to play Tory Krug, I think you're perfectly fine just playing Cole Prego instead. Like, I hate to say it, like even Nick Letty's in play here tonight. You know what I mean? Um, for the cheaper guys, uh, Vince Dunn is still out. So, you know, if you want to play Jamie Oleksiak or Adam Larson or something like that, I think that's perfectly fine. Erica Branson for Columbus, like he always projects well on stochastic. He does block shots and he does get involved in the offense sometimes. One guy that stuck out to me was David Savard from Montreal. Um, he's under 4K on DraftKings now with King Gouli out. He might have to play a lot of minutes here tonight against a team that shoots a lot. Savard likes to block. I, it's more a DK than, than FanDuel specific thing, but at his price, with I think is going to be a sizable minutes bump against Carolina, I like Savard. Um, then there are a bunch of cheap guys. Connor Timmons, obviously 2,700. He was in the picks article of running the power play for Toronto. Egor Zamula, 2,500. Really good home matchup against Chicago. I I'm, I'm not convinced that Zamula isn't the best puck-moving defenseman the Flyers have right now. Um, oh, he he I, just can't play defense, so Torts hates him. Right, but it's a Chicago – it's it's Chicago. So as long as he's not out and gets Bedard, I think he could have a pretty good game. Um, also mentioned uh, Mike Riley for Tampa. He's projecting really well. Uh, played 23 minutes in the last game, and he's down to 2,900 on DraftKings. So I'll mention Mike Riley. Yeah. I just – you know – if you make one mistake on the blue line with Torts, you're out of the lineup for six weeks. So let's talk about some goalies. Joel Hofer, 8,500. Yeah, I mean, he has legitimate shutout outside. The Sharks team sucks. But like, that's more of a cash game type deal for me. Um, Hell at 8,100 would probably be my spend up in GPPs. I think Swayman also fine there. Um, we did like Markstrom until Daily Deposit Frostback said he was in consideration, so you can X that out. I'm just kidding. No, I do like Markstrom. Um, 7,300, 
Like the Kings do have high shot volume, so Markstrom could see the saves bonus. Even in a loss, there at seventy three hundred. Say he gives up like four on forty, you're still looking okay. Um, Joey Decord seven K, I think is okay as well. Sam Montembeau, like goalies against Carolina are a bit scarier now that Jay Kensel's on the team, so you could do it. But like with Decord there, I'd rather just play Decord for seven K. Yeah, Hellebuck is the spend-up option that stands out at 8,100. I was thinking about writing – I was writing up him or writing up Jacob Marsham for the article. I wrote up Jacob Marsham instead. Do like Marsham at home against the Kings. Um, Kings do shoot a lot. They're still not a great five-on-five -five scoring team. Like, they're a lot better than they were two months ago, but they're still not, like, you know, one of the elite teams or anything like that. Um, I think there are some spend-down options, like – you know, Alex Nadalkovich uh, for Pittsburgh, it's not a spend down. He's 7,700. He's a little bit more expensive, but I think he's perfectly fine against a pretty bad Columbus team. Um, Sam Montembeau, like, I agree with you. It's kind of interesting, like, him at home against Carolina or Soderblom on the road um, against, against Philadelphia. Like, Soderblom's had a much worse season. I think it's a much worse team, and they're on the road, but, you know, He's not facing Carolina. Like, I think there are cheap options. There are a lot of cheap options you can play here tonight. Soderblom, uh, Montebo, like Marstrom, is easily my favorite under 7,500. Um, but if you want to pay a pay up, I think it would be uh, Nadalkovich at 77 or uh, Connor Hellebuck at 8,100. Yeah, I agree. Um, if you aren't using Tampa tonight, like, I think you have some pretty good free range to fit in almost any goal you want if you don't. You know, use one of those super expensive D men. Who you like him for your hat trick pick? Uh, he doesn't shoot a lot, but I think he's everything's lining up for a uh, pretty good game for him here tonight. I'm going to go with Seth Jarvis. <laughs> that makes me chuckle because we were we were you, you shared that article about Jarvis being the best uh, draft pick from the 2020 class, and he's been great, but like. Carolina beat writers are some of the, the Homer highways, but I'm going, uh, I, I can't stay away. Like he's my guy. Uh, Gabriel Velarde. You had to do it to him. You had to do yep. it. Yeah. He's, you know, I played him all the time when he's on the Kings. Got to, got to stick with it. I like the guy. That line is really, really good uh, with him there in Winnipeg. We will be back a, a lot next week we'll figure out a schedule um i mean monday we'll monday like for sure so yeah we'll definitely be here monday i think wednesday is the question mark um yeah. so we'll we will see you on monday that's for sure good luck everybody tonight if you're playing ufc hopefully your guy doesn't get knocked out mine will just usually how it goes and uh see you monday good luck good, good luck tonight everyone <laughs>